Let us begin our service today with the singing of hymn number 236. Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto thee that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against thee by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to thine infinite mercy, seeking and imploring thy grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
O most merciful God, who has given thine only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins. And by thy Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of thee, and of thy will, and true obedience to thy word, to the end that by thy grace we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, hath had mercy upon us, and hath given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgiveth us all our sins. To them that believe on his name, he giveth power to become the sons of God, and hath promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord filleth the world. Hallelujah. Let the righteous be glad. Let them rejoice before God. Yea, let them exceedingly rejoice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate leave before The Lord be with you. Let us pray.
Send, we beseech thee, almighty God, thy Holy Spirit into our hearts, that he may rule and direct us according to thy will. Comfort us in all our temptations and afflictions. Defend us from all error and lead us into all truth, that we, being steadfast in the faith, may increase in love and in all good works, and in the end receive everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. You may be seated. The Old Testament lesson for today is found in the second chapter of the book of the prophet Joel, beginning at verse 21. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause you to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Here endeth the Old Testament lesson. The epistle lesson for today is found in the second chapter of the book of Acts, beginning at verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia, and in Judea and Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others, mocking, said, these men are full of new wine. Here endeth the epistle lesson.
please rise for the reading of the gospel, which for today, Pentecost, Pentecost Sunday, is found in the 18th chapter of the gospel according to Luke, beginning at verse 18. Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 27. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good save one, that is, God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing. Sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, how hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through, the eye, through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they that heard it said, Who then can be saved? And he said, The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Here endeth the gospel lesson. Let us now confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You may be seated. We continue with the singing of hymn number 215. Thank you. 
May the Lord grant that peace dwell in you all the days of your life, and that you all dwell forever with him in heaven. Amen. Dear Christians, as I get older each year and even month by month, I often think to myself, if I only knew then what I know now, I would have done such and such differently. The same lament is echoed throughout the world on a much greater degree day by day. It is the common refrain of finite man who want to apply present wisdom to the past in order to avoid some trouble. Yet we all know this is impossible. One cannot change the past, but must always have an eye on the present as it pertains to the future. Yet in another sense, There is future wisdom which can be applied to the past, looking at our present day from the vantage point of the future, and make changes for the good and avoid disaster or trouble. No, I am not speaking of time travel. I am not pretending to prophesy of future events, but I am saying that there is great wisdom given to us to guide and protect us in our present day, but it is largely ignored. Turning to John chapter 14, let us read verse 29. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, ye might believe. We have been given wisdom from on high, from the almighty God himself, about what will take place at the end of the world, at the end of our lives, telling us about damnation and salvation. This wisdom is the very thing which many pine after in in regret day after day about events in their past. Yet many ignore this wisdom, declaring that they do not want to be held under the shackles of religion or be bound by the whims of a deity, and so be it. Indeed, they will not be bound, they will not be shackled. But once again, the common refrain they have repeated throughout their lives wishing for wisdom that would have changed their actions in the past will be repeated once again on their day of judgment. But this time they will realize that they had the very thing that they longed for, but rejected it. Many know that they have been told, many have heard it often, and yet do not hear it, do not heed it in order to silence their own conscience concerning these things and to make themselves feel better about their unbelief and willful willful ignorance, they declare themselves to be at peace. They declare their intention to provide world peace, to establish peace between races, classes, genders, and between Mother Earth and humanity, among many other things. They declare that one can be at peace while living in abominable sin, to be at peace in their conscience by saying that there is no such thing as good and evil, sin or righteousness, but all things are open and available unto each and every person. Let us turn to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 6, and read verses 13 through 15. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, every one is given to covetousness, and from the prophet, even unto the priest, every one dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. It is a false peace, a pseudo peace, one which is not real and true. It is this aspect today that we will look at 
to come to the conclusion of peace, which is true and lasting peace. The triune God has revealed himself as the God of peace, the Prince of peace, but it is a true peace, not feigned or false. On this day of Pentecost, then, it will be our purpose, according to our text for today, to see the keeping of Jesus' word. Now we remember that Pentecost is the day in which we observe the work of the Holy Spirit within the heart of sinful man. But this work, as we will see, is comprehended in the person, work, and word of Jesus Christ. Let us then see these things according to our text for today, which is found in the 14th chapter of the Gospel according to John, beginning at verse 23. Please rise for the reading of the text. John chapter 14, verses 23 through 27. Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So far our text, let us pray. O dearest comforter, we come before thee today, learning that all we are, all the good within us, is due to thee alone and we are entirely unworthy of the least of all thy mercies unto us. We thank thee for thy great and glorious work of bringing us to saving faith, faith in Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Dwell within us and make the glory of Christ shine forth from us, brighter than the beams of the sun, giving life to all who receive its rays. By thy indwelling within us, grant us thy wisdom, which brings true and lasting peace both to our conscience and with thee. Remove from us all transgression, purify our hearts, cleanse our thoughts, words, and deeds, that we may walk as becometh those that bear thy name and thy word. <clears throat> Cause that many would take of thy wisdom while it is still day, before time runs out and the time of grace is over and the time of judgment begins. Grant that we whom thou hast taken hold of by thy word be ambassadors for thee in thy word. Grant us thy peace that we may be thy children and thou our God and dwell with thee in righteousness and purity forever. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Guided then by God's spirit, let us learn what it is to keep Jesus' word, learning first that it is by the gift of faith. We read verses 23 and 24 of our text. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. The opening words of Jesus in our text are often twisted and contorted to make it seem as if Jesus is declaring that a man is loved by the Father because of that man's obedience to Christ and the Word, specifically the Gospel. Yet that is not at all what Jesus actually says, quite the opposite, in fact. Thus, we are looking at what exactly it means to keep Jesus' Word and what is the Word of Jesus. If we turn to chapter 6 of the book of John, and read verse 63, we will find the answer. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. Jesus says that his word is life, and thus it must be that his word is the gospel primarily, 
for we know that the law only kills. The law only condemns. And so Jesus must mean here in our text that if we keep the gospel, the Father loves us. For how can one love the Father if he is dead in the spirit through the law? The law kills and therefore cannot be what Jesus here speaks of. For those who are dead cannot love. Thus, what we really need to understand is how to keep the gospel. Now, the gospel by necessity has nothing to do with obedience, for it is comprehended in work outside of man entirely, and therefore it is not a work of man at all. And thus it must be that Jesus is here speaking of faith in the gospel. Let us turn to chapter 3 of the book of Romans and read verses 27 and 28. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Paul makes it clear that the gospel in its very essence is a work outside of man and applied to men by means of the gospel and received by faith. Faith is that which takes hold of all those gospel promises given in Scripture. Thus, Jesus is not saying that the Father will love a man who obeys the law, but, those, but loves those who believe the gospel. Thus it is that on this day of Pentecost, we have a very appropriate discussion on the topic of salvation. The Holy Ghost is sent by Jesus, as he says later in our text, for the specific purpose of teaching and calling to remembrance. What else is this but teaching by the word, by the gospel, thereby converting souls to faith, and such faith then takes hold of those things. This is the work of the Spirit in calling men by the gospel and enlightening them by the same. Have you ever wondered how many in this world just cannot see the things that we can see and which seem so obvious to us? Let us turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and read verses 10 through 14. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Men cannot receive the wisdom we spoke of at the opening of this sermon because they resist the working of the Holy Spirit and thereby resist and reject faith and thereby resist and reject wisdom. They cannot know them because only those who have the Spirit of God can receive it, for only the Spirit can receive it. Lest we think to ourselves, though, that we are somehow better than they, we must remember that faith is a gift of the Spirit by the Word and not a work of man. We did nothing, but were granted it by the Holy Ghost and the grace of God in Jesus Christ our Savior. Thus the keeping of Jesus' Word is by the gift of faith in the sanctification of the Spirit. We read verses 25 and 26 of our text. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. As we heard a couple weeks ago, Jesus would send the Spirit after his ascension into heaven. But all believers have the Spirit already because of the faith that was given them by the Spirit. Jesus is here saying that the Comforter's work is to lead and guide the church in the truth of the gospel forevermore. Teaching all things is the entire work of the Spirit, or sanctification in the wider sense. It is the taking of condemned sinners to glorified saints, of calling men by the gospel, enlightening them with his gifts, 
gathering them into one doctrine, sanctifying them or moving them to good works and keeping them in the one true faith unto the end and thus glorifying them. His work is to impart that wisdom of damnation through unbelief and salvation through faith in Jesus Christ for the remission of sins to mankind. This he does by the gospel through the means of grace. Truly, he could work immediately, that is, face to face, but he chooses to work through the gospel. Who are we to say that he should work on us in another way? This is the reason why the rich man who petitioned Abraham to send Lazarus back from the dead to his brothers on earth so that they might believe was denied his request because the Holy Ghost has provided the word and there is no excuse left for those who reject God's given way of salvation. The excuse, I wish I knew then, what I know now, will hold no water, for they had the truth. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they hear, though one rose from the dead. For the power of God is found in the gospel where he has placed it, and his power is not more effective in a resurrected person than it is in the word. This is the reason why Jesus speaks of keeping his words or his gospel because therein this power of the Spirit was placed, and therein does the Spirit work, and therefore therein is our salvation found. If we reject the wisdom of God, granted in great measure unto us and freely given to us, what is left? What hope do we have if we reject it? Truly nothing. The only thing left is regret, shame, and everlasting contempt. But truly, dear Christians, we are given the comforter by faith in the gospel, the gift of faith. We have the comfort that we have been forgiven and will be saved, that all the trials and troubles we now endure are as nothing compared to those things prepared for us from the foundation of the world. Thus is the keeping of Jesus' word by the gift of faith in the sanctification of the spirit unto peace. We read verse 27 of our text. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. We have now come full circle to true and lasting peace, unlike the supposed peace which the world and Satan offers. Their peace is a faux peace, a temporal peace, if accomplished at all. But leaving men with a tortured soul and eternal damnation waiting for them. This lying peace will result in anything but peace, for it will only destroy, cause agony, and enslave the souls of men reserved for the eternal pit of hell. As Jeremiah said, they continually cry, peace, peace but there is no peace. No peace apart from the keeping of Jesus' gospel word by the gift of faith in the sanctification of the Spirit unto true and lasting peace. And what is this peace? It is the peace of a conscience set free from the bonds of sin, death, and the devil. It is peace knowing that despite my sinful life, I am forgiven, granted salvation, and given hope where formerly there was only despair. It is peace with God by virtue of Christ, having satisfied the just wrath of God on account of my sin. It is the peace of knowing that no matter what takes place during this brief life on earth, that there are much greater things awaiting us in eternity for which we hope and strive. This is the kind of peace Jesus speaks of and to which the Holy Spirit leads us. From an earthly perspective, the apostles who were given this promise firsthand had anything but peaceful lives. They were persecuted, hunted, condemned, shunned, tortured, and killed. But all the while, they lived in peace, the peace which is given by the Spirit of Christ and passes all understanding. Let us turn to Psalm 85 and read there verse 10. Mercy and truth are met together. 
righteousness and peace have kissed each other. It is declared that mercy and truth are met together and righteousness and peace have kissed each other. This somewhat odd statement is explained by the topic of our text. Mercy and truth usually cannot go hand in hand and meet together without one or the other being violated. For where there is truth concerning sin, there can be no mercy, for sin must be punished. Likewise, where righteousness is, there usually will be no peace due to men being unrighteous. However, in the gospel, in the person of Christ, these can meet together and kiss each other. For in the promise of a Savior slain from the foundation of the world, the truth that all men are sinners can stand side by side with the mercy of God in Christ, and neither his justice nor his love for man is violated. Likewise, the righteousness of God can kiss peace. That is, the two can exist side by side. For sinners can be at peace with God through the sacrifice of Christ and faith in his sacrifice, which faith is counted for righteousness, as Paul says in another place. This then is the keeping of Jesus' word to believe the gospel as it is offered by the Spirit in his work of sanctification unto the eternal peace of salvation in the courts of paradise. May God ever grant this unto each of us, and may many others receive this true and lasting peace by faith offered in the word of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Amen. Please rise. May the peace of God, which surpasseth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus into life everlasting. Amen. Please rise for prayer. Almighty, eternal, heavenly Father, who has poured out thy Holy Spirit upon thy church, that he may abide with it forever, preserving it in the true faith of thy holy word and enlightening it with the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Grant unto us, as we now call upon thy name, all such things as may be necessary for our salvation. We thank thee, O God, that by thy spirit we have been called to faith in Jesus Christ, given power to believe thy word, and gathered into the fellowship of thy holy church. Sanctify us that we, purged of our sin and unrighteousness, may be meet for the Master's use and prepared unto every good work. 
To this end, aid us by the witness of thy spirit to know more deeply and truly the holy scriptures, that we may become increasingly wise unto salvation and help us to continue in their teachings. Enable us to flee from the prince of this world and to follow with all who serve thee in purity of heart the things that make for righteousness, faith, charity, and peace. Kindle in us a fervent desire for all that is good, all that is holy, all that is true. Shed thy spirit upon us, that we may love Jesus Christ our Savior with all our hearts and minds, keep his words with a good conscience, and find in each day the blessed experience of his nearness and abiding presence. Let the sanctifying wisdom and power of the eternal Comforter descend upon thy church, that she may be strong in faith. Impart to her his sevenfold gifts of grace, that her elders may have bright hopes of the time when the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters that cover the sea. Stir up thy church, O Lord, and imbue it with zeal to seek the lost, to bind up the brokenhearted, to bring comfort to the imprisoned, to heal the afflicted, and to cheer all that mourn. Give thy spirit room in all homes, that he may lead every child who bear the, bears thy name into the paths of love and obedience, and endow every parent with an understanding heart and gentle ways, so that together the family may adorn the doctrine of our Savior with godliness and honor. Govern the nations upon the earth, and help them to acknowledge thy power, dominion, and righteous judgment, so that they may turn from their evil ways and live. Give unto our land, and all in authority, firmness in the right, and steadfastness in integrity, and be thou our shield and buckler. To all in trial or tribulation, the sick, the weary, the oppressed, the fearful, the needy, and the lonely, give the peace of Christ. Let their cry come unto thee, and grant them all things needful. These things we pray in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with the singing of hymn number 234. Oh. 
Please rise. Grant, we beseech thee, almighty God, unto thy church, thy Holy Spirit, and the wisdom which cometh down from above, that thy word, as becometh it, may not be bound, but have free course, and be preached to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, that in steadfast faith we may serve thee, and in the confession of thy name abide unto the end. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. You may be seated. We close with the singing of hymn number 225. Oh.